Okay, so uh, good morning to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here in Poznan. And uh, we had the opportunity to share with colleagues the new guidelines on the management of valvular heart disease from the European Society of Cardiology and the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery. My name is Alec Vagnon. I had the pleasure to chair this effort together with Ottavio Alfieri from Milan and uh, work in uh, this task force as, as a member, Professor Jung from Paris, and also as a key player, Professor Raphael Rosenheg from Vienna, who wrote uh, the major papers on which the evidence was based and who kindly reviewed the document. So maybe, Bernard, you can start. Uh, um, the first part of uh, these guidelines is dedicated to uh, the general patient assessment. Of course, uh, each assessment should be specific of the type of valve disease, but it is uh, possible to propose a general workup uh, for evaluating any patient with valvular heart disease. Um, the first step remains clinical assessment, which is uh, key for diagnosing heart valve disease by auscultation in asymptomatic patients and also to assess symptoms which play a key role in uh, inter indications for intervention and who have a, an important prognostic value. Uh, clinical assessment is also the first step uh, to evaluate comorbidities. Uh, echocardiography uh, is a cornerstone of investigations. Uh, however, uh, we should not stick to one number for assessing the severity of valvular heart disease. And these guidelines uh, uh, still emphasize the need for an integrative approach combining different indices uh, such as uh, valvaria and flow dependent indices in valvular stenosis and uh, quantitative and semi-quantitative measurements for valve regurgitations and all these indices should be checked with uh, the clinical data. Um, other non-investigation -investig uh, uh, now uh, give uh, a growing part to uh, exercise evaluation, uh, exercise testing and uh, exercise echo, uh, cardiac resonance, uh, magnetic imaging uh, is also subject of growing interest. Uh, and at the present time, invasive investigation uh, for the assessment of the severity of valve disease uh, are now seldom performed and should be considered only in the rare cases where non-invasive investigation are not conclusive. At the end of this workup, uh, clinical decision making uh, will uh, rely on the uh, risk-benefit assessment between the spontaneous uh, history, the natural history, uh, of the valvular heart disease, according to the type of disease, to the presence of symptoms, and other patient characteristics, and which should be weighed against the risk of intervention. Uh, and uh, we now have uh, different multivariate scoring systems, which have been developed to assess the risk of interventions. Uh, there have been uh, many controversies over the last years regarding the usefulness and the limitations of these uh, scoring systems. Um, this has been uh, reviewed in depth uh, by uh, in a recent position paper from the Working Group on Valvular Heart Disease, which was uh, uh, headed by Raphael Rosenheck. And uh, uh, in the guidelines, it is clearly stated that we should use risk score because they are the only means to reduce the subjectivity of risk assessment. But we should also be aware of their limitations, in particular in high-risk patients, uh, in whom uh, they lack uh, accuracy, in particular in the calibration that is there are discordances between the uh, discrepancies between predicted and observed mortality. And uh, uh, finally, uh, this uh, risk assessment should be integrated, this course should be integrated into uh, clinical uh, judgment, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, particularly uh, the uh, common line of all these guidelines. Uh, when it comes to indications for surgery, um, the, most, the strongest indication is obviously based on symptoms. But there is an increasing discussion on whether we should perform elective surgery in selected asymptomatic patients. And I think uh, especially uh, this updated version of, of the recent guidelines has seen some fundamental changes in that regard. The basis uh, obviously goes together with increasing and, and 
and improved surgical results, improved surgical techniques, and improved data uh, that allow us, that permit us a risk stratification even in asymptomatic patients, identifying those patients who are likely to develop symptoms in the near, near future, and also identifying patients, patients who have a potentially unfavorable outcome after surgery, depending on preoperative characteristics. And most of these uh, changes in the recent guidelines are highlighted in the, in the domain of aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Uh, in aortic stenosis, a class 2A indication had already been uh, uh, defined for patients with a calcified aortic valve and a rapid hemodynamic uh, progression. What is new in the recent guidelines is that very severe aortic stenosis defined by peak aortic jet velocity of more than 5.5 meters per second is now considered a class 2A indication. And we have also increasing data uh, with regard to BNP, with regard to exercise induced changes in transvalvular gradients, and also with regard to left ventricular hypertrophy, which should now be considered and are now a class 2B indication for elective surgery in these patients. When it comes to mitral regurgitation, evidently uh, the advances in mitral repair techniques are now established and they're also recognized by the guidelines stating that this is the, the preferred uh, choice of therapy. And when it comes to elective surgery in asymptomatic patients, what is new is that uh, now a drop in ejection fraction below 60% and an end systolic diameter of more than 45 millimeters is a recognized class one indication for surgery. And in patients with flay leaflets who have a low operative mortality and a good chance of having a successful valve repair, an end systolic diameter for the left ventricle of more than 40 millimeters uh, is now an indication where surgery should be considered as a class 2A indication. Evidently, we have more data on pulmonary hypertension, which is also factored into these guidelines, but I think we clearly are moving into the direction of earlier surgery, but an individualized risk assessment is fundamental for the decision-making in these patients. Okay, and uh, maybe the last words could be on the transcatheter aortic valve implantation in patients with aortic stenosis. So it's uh, the first time that uh, this indication for this technique were discussed in a guideline worldwide. And uh, here we clearly made the point that uh, this procedure should be undertaken only by a multidisciplinary team and should be performed only in centers with cardiac surgery on site, not only for safety, but also because we feel that the selection of the patient is better performed in centers with very large experience on valve disease, which can only be the case in centers with cardiac surgery. We stated that TAVI, transcatheter aortic valve implant, is indicated in inoperable patient, but patient with sufficient life expectancy and quality of life. TAVI should also be considered in high-risk patient when after discussion with the, within the heart team, cardiologists and surgeons considered that according to anatomy, according to the clinical condition, TAVI is probably better suited for the individual patient than surgery. And also in this document, it was clearly stated that today, with the current data we have, with the current device we have, with the experience, we should not perform TAVI in patients at intermediate risk as agreed upon by the heart team. So thanks for attention.